having me. I feel like Duck, Duck, Goose. I'm on the one in the center right now. <laughs> so I'm here today to chat to you about prior authorization and health insurance. Before we do that, I thought it only pertinent to start with a little bit of my backstory, which is a little bit unusual. So I grew up internationally with European parents, uh, English father and a German mother, in boarding schools in Europe with Catholic nuns who were allowed to beat you back in the 90s still. <laughs> True story. And home base was an out island in the Bahamas. It still is 40 years later. I moved every two years of my life. I engaged in global wilderness survival programs. Why I engaged in kicking my own ass, I'm not sure, but I think it helped save my life, and you'll see why shortly. And I even moved to China when I was 16, at, um, when I graduated high school at a young age. And my Italian kickboxing instructor, he did not speak English, and I did not speak Italian. I learned the language quite quickly. We even ended up in jail together in northern China near the Mongolia border in sub-zero temperatures. Um, I called my mother with two minutes on my phone card. Mom, I love you. I'm going to jail. Give me one week. If I'm not out, call the State Department because she knew some people there. I did get out, almost left the Italian there, but uh, we survived. It was one of the most transformational experiences of my life, actually. Taught me to really understand um, global um, socioeconomic issues and understand what other people in different countries go through on a daily basis. And then I popped over and went to university in Los Angeles where I was living at the Playboy Mansion. Not my smartest decision. <laughs> a couple years later, I, moved, I transferred to the University of Miami, where I majored in entrepreneurship, and I um, engaged in business plan competitions. I then thought life would just hand me a job. It does not work that way at 23. And I then worked for the Rockefeller family in politics in my 20s. And I was jaded by politics because I transferred from LA to South Beach to the University of Miami. And a few years later, I decided to quit my job and I asked my dad, I said, Dad, I want to be a donor one day and I want to help humans. How do I do that? He said, well, you should be a technical analysis day trader. I said, amazing. How do I do that? He goes, well, you have to study. So I quit my job, sold everything I own, put it into a bank account totaling $5,000, moved back home to the very out island of the Bahamas where I was allowed to live there. I took care of the property and I put myself through a 12,000 page course. So at sunset, I would chat with my dad, the most, the most intelligent man I know, about macroeconomics under a tiki hut bar at sunset. Then came August 21st, 2010. It was a typical day in the Bahamas. I remember saying to my mom, I love my life. I wouldn't change a thing. A mere 10 minutes later, I take a dive off a tiki hut bar. And I didn't see how shallow it was. And I dive head first in the sand. Bam, I was paralyzed instantly. And I knew it. I was floating fully conscious upside down in the water, waiting for what felt like an eternity to be saved. My mom knew something was wrong. She rushed over and she saved my life. We have the entire accident caught on camera, actually. And this is where the wilderness survival training comes in. I had to direct my own medical care for 22 hours. I told them how to roll me, how to create a neck brace, which we made out of coconuts. No, I'm really serious, it's not a movie. And um, it took walls of thunderstorms, multiple jets, but we arrived to Miami for emergency surgery. The surgeon walked in and told me I was paralyzed from the chest down with paralyzed hands. I call them my paws. They're very useful. And he said I was a quadriplegic. I looked, I looked at him thinking to myself, you think? And, you know, I questioned myself, how much worse could it get? It's never a great question to ask yourself how much worse could it get. For the next, I'm going to fast forward. For the next seven straight years in a row, I lived in and out of hospitals with every medical complication on the planet and over 11 surgeries. Some of my medical portfolio included cervical cancer, pressure sores, um, pulmonary embolisms, hyperthyroidism, osteoporosis, chronic pain, burning me alive, even as I am right here with you today, feels like pins and needles. And a few years later, I questioned, you know, what was happening? Why was life? Life was not fair. I like the thing that came from the Disney movies in the 1980s, right? Always a happy ending. Well, a few years later, I moved back to China for life-saving spinal surgery because the U.S. healthcare system failed me. I'm going to go under liability reasons, and I'm sticking to that story. So we moved to China. My dad found an incredible surgeon of the People's Liberation Army, and they saved my life. Uh, they performed a 12-hour procedure in four hours, I might add, because a lot more people per capita break their neck in China, merely due to the population size. 
Um, I woke up um, on ibuprofen. They have a very different philosophy on pain management, which we forgot to ask about. So I was intubated, violently thrashing around. They tied me down to the bed, literally, with purple string. Uh, I passed out, waking up from this nightmare. Then they, they then overdosed me on morphine, not once, but twice. Walls were melting, hallucinogenic spiders were coming down to eat me, holding on to my brother for dear life. I then commenced a rehab program, it's called a walking program, where they then broke my leg in eight different places. Um, they did not cast it, and it was due to poor PT education and undiagnosed osteoporosis. I then spent the next year in and out of bed in China, um, so hopeless and so helpless, I couldn't really understand what the point of living this life was until I recall something my dad said to me in the ICU. He said, kid, you broke your body, literally he said this, you broke your body, not your brain, get to work. Remember, he's English. And so I started to believe in a way forward again, and life happened again. I moved to Raleigh from China in 2016, and I developed a stage four pressure sore. Who here knows what a pressure sore is? Okay, for those of you that don't, if you put your skin together um, and it's any pressure, within two hours later, your skin cells physically start to die. Within a few weeks, your skin dies from the inside. A giant hole um, can happen with on your buttocks or your heels, and I can't feel my butt. And so it left me in bed for an entire year in Raleigh, lived at Rex a lot, multiple field surgeries due to surgeon errors and health insurance failing me because they said, this surgery is not approved for three months until you try X, Y, and Z therapy, um, which if they read the research, it wasn't indicated for people with low mobility and lack of circulation. So during this year, this is when health insurance started coming to my life. When I was first injured, my parents advocated for me. I was literally just in survival mode. And I had a lot of time in bed. All I did, I was still working professionally, full time as a day trader. I still day trade today. And I got really angry. And so I started to read corporate policy for fun. Um, I wish I would have chosen dancing as an advocacy, but um, there you be, health insurance. And I started to notice that I got all of my paperwork and it took dozens of calls. And I realized that a lot of my general practitioners, they were writing three, sentence of, three sentences of letters of medical necessity. Who knows what a letter of medical necessity is? Couple, okay. Anytime you want to service a product, um, a prescription, your doctor has to write a letter of medical necessity saying why is this product medically necessary for this patient. They then submit it to health insurance for prior authorization, which we'll get into in a minute. So I learned to write these letters of medical necessity and I back them up by peer-reviewed journal articles, no less than 50 articles per letter of medical necessity, stating that um, in my condition with low mobility, this piece of equipment is medically necessary for me. Um, and then you generally get denials. I'll go through that process in a minute. And then you have to fight um, and navigate the health insurance appeals process. A little bit different in private insurance versus Medicare and Medicaid. Um, same process, just different offices. And um, for Obamacare and affordable health care, in 2023, one tenth of one percent, I'm going to say that again, one tenth of one percent of denials were appealed by patients. What does that mean? That means that most people believe their health insurance companies when they say, this is not medically necessary for you. The sad reality is, and I don't wanna beat up on any one organization, but with health insurance companies, for those of us with complex medical needs, and I'm not talking about as serious as mine, but many of you with unseen disabilities, chronic illnesses, you broke an arm, diabetes, high cholesterol, it's more profitable for health insurance companies to keep you alive because you're just in that middle area. For myself and many of, many of, us, many of those like me um, with, with three and four different um, secondary complications, we are too expensive. That's a reality, right? You're thinking of the mafia slogan, it's not personal, it's business. I mean, you know, you, you'd like to really believe these health insurance companies have your best interests at heart, but that's just not the reality because a lot of it comes down to economics and finances. And I'm a realist. I now work in corporate disability strategy consulting. I'm a keynote speaker, healthcare advocate, still a day trader. So I see a lot of different lenses and angles all the time. And so during this year in bed, it was very transformational. And then I partnered with organizations around the globe on different healthcare equity initiatives. I even worked for years with um, the Item Coalition, which is a coalition made up of 90 doctors, lawyers, PTs, OTs, clinicians, patient advocates, where we worked tirelessly with Medicare in Washington, D.C. to for the use of power seat elevators. 
what you see with my chair here today, there's a lot of medical benefits for those of us in wheelchairs. And after several years, we finally won and reclassified power seat elevators as medically necessary. It's really challenging to just get a code switch at Medicare. It takes years. Well, I'm happy to say in June of 2023, this legislation took effect. There's a huge, tens of thousands of wheelchair users are now affected by this and have the use of power seat elevators. Because when I was denied mine, I got angry. But I don't know if you know this, with insurance, if you were denied and something's not medically necessary, you can fight that. That means that you have avenues through multiple appeals process. And even if your insurance company denies you to the highest level, you can go above their head to the Department of Insurance with private insurance or the judicial system with Medicare and Medicaid. And they have the power to file an external review to reverse your healthcare's decision. I don't know if you know that. It took me years to figure that out on my own. Um, it, was, it was quite astounding. So when I was denied a power seat elevator, it was under a convenience item. And I quote, this is my air quotes a convenience item. And I said no. So I reached out to 57 investigative news reporters in North Carolina because I'm pleasantly persistent. <laughs> I will stalk you with a smile and be very pleasant, but until I hear from you, I even went outside to Blue Cross and Blue Shield CEO's uh, office for a month, and you know he would not meet with you if you were wondering. Um, and two reporters took my story, and the work went national. That's how I got on the coalition for power seat elevators. But I appreciate a lot of patients um, and folks with regular day jobs, they don't have the ability, whether you're just trying to survive in life, take care of your kids, um, your job's overwhelming, don't have that ability to advocate. So it's folks in this room, like myself, different nonprofits, and people willing to donate their time to step up to advocate for those who can't advocate for themselves. So this work led me to be humbly crowned as Wheelchair America um, two years ago. <laughs> I like to preface by saying there's an advocacy competition, not a beauty competition, okay? <laughs> and it was, it was amazing, and I used this work for good and then worked all around the country and traveled all around the country in that year, which then prompted a lot of my speaking, which I absolutely adore to help um, people. But my core passion is I turn my individualistic passion to survive into a shared collective purpose to help other people. So that kind of brings us to today. So I want to back up to prior authorization. So I want to make this a little bit interactive, so I'm going to ask some questions. Who in the room understands the prior authorization process just with your own health plan? A couple. A little bit. So-so. Okay. No, no, no. I love when people don't know, right? And I have to tell you, I'm learning and they're constantly changing laws and regulations all the time. It's hard to keep up. But whenever, like I mentioned, you need anything from your doctor, it starts with prior authorization. You work with your doctor first to, for them to write a letter of medical necessity. In this letter of medical necessity, they have to write your name, all of your, your birthday and your details, CPT codes, all these different medical codes. Oftentimes denials come because one T is forgot to be crossed or one I, it's very unfortunate. And then they submit it to your insurance company. It's a first level um, of you're likely going to get denied unless it's something very simple like a cholesterol medicine as an example. If you need any kind of imaging that's not indicated or your doctor isn't a big advocate for you you're going to have to advocate for yourself, unfortunately. This is just a sad reality. And you have to literally, you know, I have an incredible doctor here, it's Dr. Ken Holt, and he's a one, yes. He is a one-man show with an incredible team. And when I first met him five, six years ago, six years ago, hey, I said, listen, I know you don't know a lot about spinal cord injury, I am going to teach you. And he was receptive. I sent him clinical papers on spinal cord injury, and he read up and he said, I'm a little busy, I'm gonna need your help. So I would write the letters of medical necessity. He would review all of um, the work I put in it, and we did it as a team together. This is not the norm. This is, this is not usual. Most doctors have so many patients, or they're in this conglomerate of doctors and offices, and they literally don't have the time physically, whether it's insurance mandated, you get 15 minutes with them, or 30 minutes with them, whatever it may be. So they may want to help you, but they don't. And they can't, they just don't have the ability. So it's really on becoming your own self-advocate or showing your patient here. It's very simple. Let's create a 10-step guide to give patients on how to either write a letter of medical necessity, what are the resources, where can I get help for this. And so once it goes to your insurance company, they review it. And if it's not complicated, they'll approve it, like I mentioned. And then it'll come back to you. And if you get a denial, you go through something called the first level of appeals. 
Do you know how many levels of appeals there are generally in health insurance companies, anyone? No, this is good. On average, and I'm going to use private insurance company right now. It's a little tricky with Medicaid because it's different in every state. Medicare is a little, a little bit more straightforward, but even taking private insurance for a moment, there are two levels of appeals, and inside there could be also a doctor review in there depending on the product. Each level of appeals that you go through with your health insurance company, it's a different team. Oftentimes, if you're a cancer patient, you need a cancer drug, and that first level of appeals team, there's no one there who has any experience with cancer, honestly. I'm sorry to say, but a lot of them are like paper pushers. And that's a sad reality. You have to be ready for that. And how do you get ready for that? Well, you have to just anticipate, because it takes what? Unless it's a, an emergency, um, what, you have 72 hours, an emergency authorization, it's 30 to 60 days on average. So during that 30 to 60 days, you get the second level. You get the first level of appeals ready. And the second, they're going to ask for a patient letter. They're going to ask for a more detailed letter of medical necessity from your doctor and or specialist, whether it's your general practitioner, your cardiologist. And I highly recommend that from patient perspectives or if you're advocating for people, that you get them to have one champion, whether it's like my wheelchair provider or my general practitioner, Dr. Holt, or it's for a cardiologist. You want to have someone that has central control of all of that info. For me personally, I look at all of that info before it gets sent, but I appreciate not a lot of people do that. So generally with your first level appeals, if it's very simple, you're usually going to get approved on average. If you're denied the first level appeals, the second level of appeal, it's pretty much all of the same paperwork as the first. Maybe a few more detailed notes and a little more patient letter, you know, a, a added patient letter. I will tell you though, I've tried the empathy route. It doesn't work. They, I want to say they care, they just don't, right? I'm, you know, I, I've given the sob story. Um, and then I started fighting back with research. And even when there's not a lot of research out there, for example, there's not a lot of research for spinal cord injury patients for the use of um, exercise equipment, as an example. Okay, fine. So what do you do? Well, let's look at this differently. Let's reframe the problem. So. Not spinal cord injury, but I'm a person with low mobility, a lot of research out there. I'm a person who has poor circulation, a lot of research out there. So I connect the dots a little bit differently. I say, okay, I'm a sedentary lifestyle, <laughs> very sedentary, and I have low mobility. So the reason that you can, a lot of people with diabetes have the same, similar issues. So you can connect the dots indirectly in that way. And so through your second level appeals with your insurance companies, it will have an entirely different external team. They don't know anything about the first. If you call to follow up, um, they won't know. And here's a little tip and a trick that I learned the very hard way but has helped me ever since. In private insurance, you are entitled to a customer escalation management department representative. There's different names for these folks, but they're generally in the care management department. Because when you call, have you ever called claims and you get the different person every time and they have no idea what's going on with your case? Well, you can request this. They're not going to readily advertise this, but you keep calling. Now, this is where pleasantly persistent comes in because you have to call sometimes eight and nine times. And just remember, these folks are getting a lot of angry calls every day. So, I don't know, meditate, have a drink, have a cup of coffee, um, get ready, you know, listen to some music while you're on hold because you're going to be in it for the long haul. And it is an unpaid day job to survive. It is not fair. Life is not fair. That is the way the system works. While many of us are striving for systemic change, we have to navigate within a broken system in the meantime. I mean, that's just the way the world works. So if you get through the second level of appeals and it's not some $100,000, $50,000 um, therapy that's unheard of or experimental, um, Oftentimes you do get approved. If you do not, that's when you go to the Department of Insurance. It's very easy. Every state has one and they have one link. It says submit external review. You submit all of it, save all your paperwork, all your emails, document your calls, and you submit all the paperwork you have. And I've done this for a $30,000 medical bike. It is electro, who knows what electrical stimulation is? Um, it is basically electrical shock, for lack of a better word. They put these sticky pads on areas of your body that have are, um, atrophied, sports injuries, or if you're paralyzed, it keeps the muscle mass in, essentially. But it's experimental, and it's a very expensive bike. And it wasn't um, labeled as a convenience item, but it was labeled as um, scientific and you know, under, under review for experimentation. And so I went to the Department of Insurance in North Carolina, 
Now, you have to be patient. It took us 16 months, but Blue Cross and Blue Shield was forced to overturn their decision, writing me a $26,000 check. Um, it, was it was amazing, and it helped a couple people as well. Now, if it really is life-threatening, you um, can submit for 72 hours that they're forced to review your case if you're literally going to die and you need a life-saving treatment. I won't say it always works either. So that's the kind of the general process. And it's also really important to understand who are all the players in the process, whatever. If you are going to have a heart drug that you need for a special therapy, you're going to have a general practitioner as your first um, level of contact. You're going to have your specialist as well. For me, for example, for wheelchairs, you have a durable medical provider who's a, a wheelchair folks. They're the first level. Then I have my general practitioner and my physical therapist. So you just have to know where all the players sit and also build relationships. Be really, really nice to these folks, right? Um, always ask them how their day is on the phone. People remember that. They really, really do. Um, so that is a very high level overview. I spent a year writing a guide on how to navigate the health insurance appeals process and it's up online because I kept helping people individually and I'm only one person. I have a day job, I have to make a living, I don't get any government benefits, I make too much money. So many of us with disabilities, we're stuck in two categories. We either make too much money and the government doesn't help a lot and my cost of living is three times what yours is. I have to pay out of pocket for caregivers, um, just Blue Cross and Blue Shield alone, a marketplace plan I pay out of pocket for, what they don't cover and my deductible and my co-insurance, which we can get into if you'd like, um, that's about 20 grand a year, just right there off the top. That's not including mortgage and all that. Or you're on benefits and you can't make more than $1,200 a year, they cut you off your benefits, right? So if you don't make a really decent living, then you're, you're stuck in this box, you're barely surviving. Medicare will literally tell you how many catheters you can use a month. They are telling you how many times you can pee in a day. I had sent friends catheters because they ran out and they were starting to sterilize their own. It is atrocious, but so many of us are getting left behind because they don't know how to advocate for themselves and no one's paying attention to these issues. Someone has to make a noise. I'll do it with a smile, but um, I'm very pleasant, but I'm sneaky, you know? <laughs> yes. So I want to open the floor to questions first and anything, personal life, professional advocacy. Um, I'm a very open book. Or I'll start asking you questions about your personal lives. <laughs> I'll start. Yes. You brought all requests. Was it for the equipment, or did you have to engage in, like, on the therapeutic side, or appealing treatments, <coughs> clinical side, or was it more on the equipment side? Um, no, uh, therapeutic and equipment as well. For I mean, right now. I am in a battle every six months. I have um, severe osteoporosis, that of about an 85-year-old. I've broken my bones more times than I can count. And every six months, I get a, an injection called Prolia, which is a really um, intense injection for those with uh, severe wrist fractures that are older. And you would think by now they would have all of my information in the system. Every six months, it takes, I, I log it. It takes about 10 calls, a couple hours each and 15 different emails and they lose it and it gets stuck in major medical benefit. So basically when you have a drug, it goes through pharmacy. But if it's too expensive, it has to go through your insurance company first. And they have a whole meeting about it called major medical benefits and it gets lost in translation between four departments. So I am tenacious today actually after this, I have a call with them. Actually, I actually have a date with Blue Cross. And um, so it's for all products, everything, therapeutic and equipment. Should have invited you to the day today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yes, Tinde, yes, I'm familiar. Mm -hmm. how, how much time do you spend on letters of necessity out of your own personal time? Did you, you had to equate that to what you could charge an hour, an hourly rate, would that come up to you? How much do I charge, I, how I mean, much like time? If, like if you are dealing with a letter of necessity with an insurance ah, company. That depends, so it depends what it is. So for example, I was having a total hospital electrical bed that goes up and down, um, and the feet and head go up and down for medical reasons. And that was rather easy because it was really easy to find research on some clinical review papers on that. I appreciate not a lot of people are going to go to that effort. I probably spent about maybe 20 hours on that. Um, and then on a shower chair, a shower chair. They only give you a shower bench. Um, I'm pretty paralyzed, right? I mean, if you're going to like judge me on my level of para um, paralysis. And a shower <coughs> bench. If I'm on a shower bench, I'm going to fall forward. I'm probably going to die and hit my head. Um, a shower chair, just like this chair, tilts back, head and feet. Insurance won't approve that. 
in general. I know two people and I've lost thousands of people. And so that one, that one took a better part of 60 hours with all my research, but you have to appreciate I am very detail oriented. The average person could probably do it if they did it in probably 10 or 12 hours. So yes, what I do on the advocacy insurance side, it is, um, I lose a lot of money in life. I help other people, but once I have the standard letter, I give it to everyone who needs it as well. So that's something. So if you're a doctor and you have a specific new drug that you know works for your patients, but it, insurance is really stubborn at it, but you know it's worked for other patients, save that letter of medical necessity, save that template, and then you can pass that on to other doctors and patients, whomever it may be. So we need to, there's not a really great place to share information with each other, like one hub. And I, we run into that as well in the disability community. How do you feel about our Department of Insurance here in North Carolina when it comes to these kind of matters brought up? Have you found them to be helpful, not helpful, just doing their job? If you had a great Who's watching this interview later? <laughs> oh, gonna try to be diplomatic. It's very challenging for me at times. Um, I would agree, and I haven't worked for them in a few years because so far I, I kind of learned how to navigate the system my own. But in the beginning, whenever I had an issue, they wouldn't help me until I was denied the final level of appeals. And generally, they won't unless it's something incredibly unjust. Until I was denied two times and I had no more levels of appeal, then you submit the external review. I wouldn't say they were particularly helpful when I tried to call them on the phone. I got bounced around a lot. Um, I stayed on their case, but I think there is such a disconnect between patient advocacy and the Department of Insurance still. I had a couple meetings with people, let's say, in the Department of Insurance, and I got this beautiful lip service, and I, I work in the world of lip service in the corporate world, and uh, then there was no follow-up after. We got the photo shoot. Oh, we got the disabled chip advocating, hey, you know, but there was no follow-up after. So I'd say I was disappointed. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a legislative period went out. Well, the thing is, it's, I was disappointed, but every time you're disappointed, that's an opportunity to change something. But you need a few champions to stand up and pave the way. And honestly, I'm, I'm, this is not rocket science. Even a basic guide, a couple trainees, working with the folks, even right now, bringing patients in with their perspectives of what they go through and not patients to like con to constantly um, berate the system but okay this is the experience i had this was not pot this was delightful this was not delightful how are we going to change these components but that involves being your own advocate and thinking through through lived experiences of doctors perspectives patients perspectives even legislators' perspectives, health insurance companies, pers well, I'm not sure if you've got the health insurance companies in there, but you know, you have, and different hospitals' perspectives. I gave a keynote speech to um, a, the Healthcare Financial Management Association last March, um, top head of global revenue, a few hundred executives there, and most of them didn't even know what the difference between a deductible or a coinsurance is, which there's nothing wrong with that for most people, but they're in the medical field every single day, so there's just their lack of knowledge. I had a CEO come to me about a month later and said their kid had, their child had cancer and they couldn't understand their corporate policy and how it worked. I was astonished. Tell me what company it was. <laughs> yes, no, we're, what, what, I'm sorry? Did you tell me what company this was? Oh, I certainly did not. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. I know how to keep it a secret, thank you very much. But I helped, I helped, I helped him, and, but that just goes to show navigating the labyrinth of the health insurance appeals process for your insurance company and it's different whether it's Humana or Blue Cross or Aetna they're all they all have their pros and cons. You mentioned earlier about uh, people believing their health insurance company about whether they needed something or not about the percentage of people who are denied. One tenth of one percent. Mm -hmm. Is it I mean I would think it's because they just give up. I mean, well, I investigated a little further, and there was a lot. There's an amazing magazine called ProRepublica.org. Um, they do a lot of really great journalism pieces, and they, I follow them for health insurance. And it turns out that a lot of people believe. They just believe that, oh, okay, my health insurance company said, I can't have this. I must not be able to have it. It, it was as simple as that. And that's criminal. We have to be able to change that. And a lot of these insurance companies, they have the dollars. They have the lobbyists. I. I have a lot of friends who are lobbyists. I worked in politics for many years in my 20s. I know how the system works, but we have to disrupt the system pleasantly, forcefully, and with, you know, armed with information, not just, I'm sorry, like, 
yes, I have a great story. A lot of people, we all have great stories. We're all made up of our stories and we all have authentic lived experiences of life, but that's not gonna change the system. So we have to have the data. So data doesn't exist to, to tell the whole story, but it's a foundational piece for change. So I'm an outcome-based human and I love to come with the data, but unfortunately, a lot of my friends who advocate, they go with their personal stories trying to pull on the heartstrings and that doesn't always work. You need the heartstrings with the data. Well, you're awesome yeah. because I think I would go to bed and pull the cover in my head. And a lot of people do that and that's okay, right? I mean, mm -hmm. so there are thousands of us in the United States who are willing to go to bat for others because um, it just, when I see injustice and those, just I'll take quadriplegics for a moment, my friends, and they're, they're just trying to fight Medicare for catheters. They can't fight legislation. They're just trying to literally get through their day. They're trying to fight with Medicare and the number of hours. As a quadriplegic, they will only give you four to six hours on average of Medicare a day. I can't take care of myself. I don't know what my friends do, and they're begging friends and families. They become trapped in their own lives. They become voluntary hostages. And that breaks my heart, and that's what I just won't stand for because I feel blessed. I feel so fortunate, even though I deal with all of everything I deal with because I have the ability to do what I do. One last question. Yeah. Outside of your the, uh, insurance companies, did you feel it was more attitude or cognitive when it came to dealing with legislators, uh, state employees, federal employees, not understanding what you just said about the whole prior authorization? process and what someone has to go through? I think it's a combination of both because whenever you're, my dad always said the sign of true intelligence is taking a concept and explaining it in the level of an eighth grader but not making the other person feel unintelligent about it. So they feel like they have power of knowledge and control, right? Not using really big words to describe that. And so when I've worked with people over the last, gosh, in just in Raleigh in the last seven years, Part of it is attitude and part of it is just complacency of thinking, well, this is the way the system is. I'm not going to do anything about this. What, what can I do about it? Mm -hmm. hey, Allie, one quick question before you go, because we talked about this across the hall. If you had not been an advocate for yourself with your family advocating for you and these decisions made by insurance companies, if y'all had not fought back, how do you think your life would be different? Oh, I would be dead. I, really, they killed me seven times. Cardiac arrest. I think seven, you lose count after three. And most of them, no, I'm serious. And most of them, you know, it was the doctors and, and, and the hospital's fault that they kept killing me. But you know what, fault is past tense. Responsibility, I take 100% responsibility in my own life. That's present tense and it's action focused. It's the decisions we make right now, every single second of every single day. So I don't blame anyone. That's not gonna get you anywhere. I can't make, you know, I, I can't change that. So I've really, my personal life, and I speak on this, and it's what I work on a lot of folks with on re-examining the concept of happiness. I say don't try to be happy, it'll make you more miserable. Um, and I work on happy enough, right? We, it feels like we've become the victims of our own success. We get anxious, we get doubly anxious. This causes more anxiety, and we're like, quick, where's the vodka? So, you know, in the, in the US, a lot of our crises are no longer material, they're spiritual, and they're existential. Um, and this, you know, so I work with a lot of folks on this as well, with a ton of humor. So. The more tragic something happens in my life, the funnier I try to be. Thank you so much. Thank you.